Okay. Um, thanks, everyone. Thanks for, for a, a very kind introduction. Um, I'm going to switch to my uh, PowerPoint slides. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself before we start. So hopefully you can see my slides. Um, so, okay. Um, so yeah, my name is Ian Harris. I'm an, uh, an orthopedic surgeon. I'm in practice in Sydney in Australia. I also teach and conduct research. Um, I've published fairly widely, uh, nearly 300 uh, publications now, including New England Journal, Lancet, BMJ, JAMA, and a lot of the big surgical journals as well. Um, and I do a lot of research basically into the effectiveness of surgery. And this talk is gonna cover that pretty broadly. Um, my, uh, my main interest um, is in what we call clinical research. So I don't do any lab research. I'm not gonna show you any rat experiments. I'm not gonna show you any uh, cell experiments. All the research I do is based on patients. Uh, patients getting surgery or not getting surgery or possibly getting placebo. Um, and to start off the talk, though, uh, I, I realize that a lot of people give disclaimers, so I'm going to give a disclaimer. I have no uh, industry ties. I accept no funding from industry. Uh, I accept no salary from industry. Um, I'm paid by both the university and by my local health district, the hospital in which I work. Uh, where I perform surgery. Um, and another disclaimer, um, some people misinterpret uh, what I say and um, think that I am saying that all surgery is ineffective. Um, that is not true. I still operate and I believe many operations have, have a place, um, but I think it's being overdone. Um, now, to go back and to uh, tell you where all this started, I'm going to show you this slide here. Um, now, I don't know what it's like in other parts of the world. I know that every country has their uh, sort of water diviner uh, equivalents. Um, in Australia, it's a very large uh, and fairly dry country. And so we rely a lot on water diviners to find water. Um, and this is just lifted from a recent uh, online uh, news article showing a water diviner who strikes liquid gold uh, in a uh, uh, Australian cattle property um, where she told them where to dig for water. I used to have a, a holiday house in the, in the, towards the middle of Australia and our neighbours paid some uh, one or two hundred dollars for a local water diviner to come out and tell them where to dig the well. He told them, uh, then they dug the well and they found water. So these water diviners have been around for a long time. And it's a very important part of my history because when I was starting in medical school um, a long time ago now, uh, I had uh, sort of like an epiphany um, and <clears throat> what happened was I was sitting down watching television. Now, in those days, um, we didn't have cable TV. We didn't have uh, Netflix. Uh, uh, we just had television, which had a handful of channels, and you just watched what was on. You didn't, you didn't get to record it and watch it later. Uh, you just watched it live. And I sat down one day and turned on the television, and there was this show called... James Randi in Australia. Now, many of you will know who James Randi is. He's a very famous um, sort of debunker of, um, uh, he's, he's kind of like a skeptic who goes around uh, debunking pseudoscience. And uh, a similar person uh, in Australia, a very well-known person in Australia, a guy called Dick Smith, uh, who was a scientist and uh, uh, kind of a a skeptic of pseudoscience invited James Randi out to Australia and they created a, a, a one hour television special where they challenged these diviners. Um, 
And what they did is they got a whole bunch of uh, uh, diviners from around Australia and they said, we want to scientifically test you. And if you can prove uh, that you can find water or in one of the tests they had to find gold, um, we will give you a check. And I think at the time the check was something like $10,000, which, which back in you know 1980 or whatever was a lot of money. Um, and so they got these people together and they went out to a, a, an empty lot out the back of Sydney somewhere in the suburbs and um, they uh, dug up the dirt a bit and they laid 10 pipes um, and they labeled them one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Um, and they said to the water diviners, well, what we're going to do is we're going to run water down one of these pipes. We're not going to tell you which one and you have to tell us uh, which one it is. And if your prediction is, is accurate, you will win the prize. Um, now, this is a young kid watching this, that's me, starting on uh, a journey as a, a medical practitioner in the first year of, of medical school and being exposed to what was a very simple yet very elegant scientific experiment. Um, and I thought, what a great idea. And so what they did is they ran water. They said, well, let's test your equipment. So all the diviners got their, their special equipment, whatever it was they used for divining. And uh, they said, okay, we're going to run water down pipe number three. Um, and so the water diviners would walk across the, the test area, walk across pipe number one, walk across pipe number two, walk across pipe number three, and then their, their device would, would trigger and they'd say, oh yes, you know, definitely there's water running in pipe three. Everyone was happy that the equipment was working, the testers were happy, the div water diviners were happy. And then they began the test. And of course, from that moment on, they were blinded as to which pipe held the water. So, this testing was done over a couple of days. And as you can probably guess, the water diviners were no better than chance at finding uh, water. Um, it, it really didn't work. I think there was somewhere around 10%, um, which was uh, um, basically, they could have tossed a coin um, and they would have done just as well. So, um, the interesting thing about this was, yeah, this is a very elegant experiment. And for me, this was something like how easy it is to do these kinds of experiments. Why do we just sort of believe what people say? Why don't we test it more often? It's so easy to test. And this way we find out whether it works or not. It was just so obvious to me that this was the way to study thing and this study things and this was really the beginning of my uh, my passion and my sort of love affair with science, which carries on today. And I still do clinical trials today, and I'm still doing trials of surgery, comparing it to not doing surgery. Um, and it all started with this. Now, people think, yeah, that's fine. You know, that's a uh, that's a nice little story. Um, but what was interesting was I went back and, of course, you can find this video on YouTube. And I went back and watched it just for fun when I was writing my book in 2016. And I watched it and I thought, yeah, that's just as I remember, you know, uh, they were proved wrong and isn't science great. Um, and then something else hit me when I watched the video. And that was the reaction of the water diviners. And this to me at the time, now looking at this video some sort of 30, 40 years later, um, this is what really struck me. And what happened was they got all the water dividers in the room, they gave them the results of the experiment. They said, I'm sorry, none of you won the prize. Uh, you were no better than chance. Uh, water dividing pretty clearly doesn't work. And I thought, well, you know, the, 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 the jig is up, you know, it, it, it doesn't work. These guys need to get a new job. But none of them did. They all disbelieved the experiment and believed that water divining works. And they interviewed them and they're saying, yeah, I think there was uh, some, uh, some sunspot activity uh, that might have been playing havoc with the equipment. I think there was some, uh, some minerals in the ground, which made it difficult to detect the water. Um, there was, uh, you know, there was something wrong. Uh, the experiment wasn't right. Uh, not one of them believed the experiment. And that to me 
fascinated me because they were not looking at it scientifically. They were believing their own experience over a scientific experiment. Now, I realize now um, that that is the, the human way of behaving. Humans are not natural scientists. Humans will, uh, um, will believe their own eyes over the experiment or advice of someone else that they perhaps don't trust. Um, and uh, so to, to me, this was the same as the reaction of surgeons to experiments showing that the surgery they perform doesn't work. Now, I have seen this now for many decades. I have lectured widely on this, uh, and, and I see it happen over and over, where the practitioner doesn't believe the evidence that flies in the face of their practice. Now, the reason they weren't seeing this scientifically and the reason why water divining is still uh, popular today, even 40 years after this was, uh, this was aired, is because they keep finding water. Now, the reason why they keep finding water is this interesting map here, which is a map of Australia, and the green part is where, if you dig, you will find water. So this is something called the Great Artesian Basin, um, and pretty much anywhere Australia, in Australia, except that yellow patch in the middle where nobody lives, and the yellow patch on the top right, which are mountains, um, you can dig on any farm property and you will find water. Um, so James Randi summarized it when he said to the water diviners, he said, the biggest challenge for you would be if we called you out to a property, we got you to use your equipment, walk around the property and tell us where to dig where we will not find water. And they wouldn't be able to do it. And this is something called, you know, the counterfactual, uh, which people often don't think about. It's the other side of the coin. Um, and, and this is really the same reaction with surgery. I'm going to show you a whole lot of surgical procedures that we're going to talk about. Um, and what happens is that people will tend to improve after these operations. And so surgeons in a way are finding water. Surgeons are the water diviners um, that find water. Their patients uh, often feel better. And so they attribute that improvement to their surgery rather than the fact that the patient would have gotten better anyway. So now let's move um, into the field of surgery. And I'm going to take you through a few um, examples, fairly famous examples of where surgery has been performed. It has been thought to be effective. In many cases, it's been widely adopted, but it was later shown to be completely ineffective and fortunately later stopped because of that. And the first story is about angina. Now, angina is a, a chest pain that is due to um, uh, uh, insufficient blood supply to the heart. So as many of you know, the heart has its own blood supply. Not only does it pump blood, but it has muscles in it and it needs blood. And if those uh, blood vessels are narrowed or uh, are clotted, then you can get a heart attack. But if you don't get a heart attack, you can get angina first, which is the chest pain associated with cardiac um, ischemia, it's called. So angina, you know, it's reasonably common and it was certainly much more common uh, in the 20th century. Um, the heart disease is much uh, less common now than it used to be, but it certainly was uh, one of the biggest killers back then. Now, in 1939, so this is going back a fair way, um, some surgeons came up with the idea of a surgical procedure to treat angina. Now, that surgical procedure was to tie off or ligate um, one of the arteries inside the chest on the chest wall. It's called the internal mammary artery. And it was one of the branches of, uh, of, uh, of an artery um, that 
if you traced it back, uh, uh, branched also into the heart to feed the heart. And the idea was if you tied off this artery, which wasn't an important artery, it went to some muscles in the chest, um, but it wasn't a life or death artery. So you could easily tie it off and not worry the patient too much. If you tied off this artery, the blood would be diverted towards the heart. So that was the theory that underlined it. Now, that theory doesn't make a whole lot of sense if you think about it for too long, but on a superficial basis, uh, it kind of made sense and it certainly made sense to the researchers at the time in 1939. Um, now, this was tested on some dogs and when they ligated the artery in dogs, they found that the blood didn't flow through the artery and they felt that there was possibly more blood flowing through the heart and this was assumed to be a good thing. So it was done in humans. And this became a uh, widely performed procedure. It was called internal memory artery ligation. It was done on many people with angina and many people with angina said they felt better afterwards. So this is what we call observational evidence. This is not um, experimental evidence. This is just doing something and seeing if people get better. And as you can, see from what I said before, this is like digging a hole and seeing if you find water. Um, it doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't mean that the, the, the water diviner was the cause of the water. And it doesn't mean that the internal memory artery ligation was the cause of the improvement in the patients, but that's what they did. And it wasn't until 1959, so this is 20 years after the procedure was developed, that uh, some researchers published a placebo controlled trial in the New England Journal of Medicine. Now this is the first proper surgical placebo controlled trial. And to many people, it's a surprise that it was published in 1959. It was only a small trial, it was only a handful of patients uh, in each group. But what they did is they randomized patients by the toss of a coin to receiving either the standard operation where they made a cut in the chest, they found this internal memory artery and they tied it off, or the placebo group where they made a cut in the chest, they found the internal memory artery, they put a suture around it, but they didn't tie the knot. So this was a fairly good placebo controlled trial. This is what we would call a high fidelity placebo controlled trial where the patients had everything done to them exactly the same, except the key ingredient, which is the actual ligation of the artery. They even had a suture uh, put around the artery. They just didn't have it tied off. So this was a fantastic placebo study. And they did this in a handful of patients and they found that the patients um, who had the internal memory artery ligation, a lot of them got better, but they found patients were just as likely to get better if they didn't have it tied off. And this went to everything. This went to, they, they did cardiac stress tests. They put them on a treadmill, uh, the whole bit. People got better, but they weren't any more likely to get better if they had the procedure. So this meant that the procedure didn't work. We'll talk later about why the patients got better because that's an important question. But the, the bottom line is that the patients got better and it wasn't due to the surgery. So fortunately, after that, the surgery was stopped. It was no longer done. It's certainly not done today. It's a historical procedure. But at the time, it was very commonly performed throughout the United States. So let's move forward now to around about the year 2000. Now, Parkinson's disease, again, it's a fairly common condition. Many of you know uh, about it. Many famous people have had Parkinson's disease. Um, and it's a, a neurodegenerative disorder. Uh, it makes it very difficult for people to move. Uh, that includes uh, talking, uh, walking, uh, things like that. Um, it's, a, it's a sometimes fluctuating disease. Um, it can be treated with, with some drugs. And, and one of the key things, and this was the subject of the uh, Awakenings book and the movie uh, with Robin Williams, um, about the use of dopamine. 
Um, and Parkinson's disease can be thought of as a, as a sort of an insufficiency of dopamine in certain cells in the brain. And if you give dopamine, you can reverse it. Um, of course, it doesn't last that long and it's not that great. But anyway, it, 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 dopamine certainly can give you a dramatic response initially. So what uh, surgeons did and, and researchers did is they said, why don't we transplant the dopamine producing cells from the brain of a fetus and put it in people's heads? The cells will then live and they will produce dopamine and they will cure the patient's Parkinson's disease. It's a fairly radical idea, but um, this was the idea. And again, it you know kind of made sense. So they did this procedure and they did this procedure by drilling a hole in the skull, going down into the brain and transplanting these fetal cells to uh, produce dopamine in the, uh, in the brain of the Parkinson's disease patients. Now they found in, in later uh, uh, autopsy findings that these cells actually did survive and did produce dopamine. So the, the mechanics behind it appeared to work, um, but did the procedure actually work? That's the question. So again, as you can tell from what I said before, there's two ways of finding out whether it works. You can just watch people and see if they say they feel better or you can actually do a proper scientific experiment where you compare this procedure to not doing this procedure to the counterfactual. Um, and so the initial results of this were fairly good. Patients uh, said they felt better, they, their Parkinson's disease wasn't nearly as bad, they were moving a lot better. Um, and so this was, you know, this was seen to be pretty good. Um, however, Eventually, and in, in around 2000, 2001, they published um, the results of a placebo trial. And what they did is they dug holes, uh, did these burr holes, they're called, these small drill holes in the skull where they inserted the cells. And in one group of patients, they inserted the cells. And in the other group of patients, they didn't. And the patients were blinded. In other words, the patients were unaware which group they were in. The patients didn't know if they were in the group that got the cells or the group that didn't get the cells, the placebo group. And then they looked at how the Parkinson's disease went afterwards. And they asked patients for days and weeks and so on following, how are you feeling? How's your Parkinson's? How's your walking going? Uh, how's your, your speech going? Um, and then they compared the two groups. And of course, what they found was the two groups were identical. There was no difference. So actually putting in these cells did nothing and certainly did nothing compared to not putting in these cells. Now let's look at another um, uh, experiment that was done. Now, migraine is incredibly common and incredibly difficult to treat. Um, and many scientific discoveries are discovered by accident. They're fortuitous discoveries. And what happened once was um, there was a, a doctor who was doing a procedure, um, which was a cardiac procedure. And it was a, a percutaneous procedure. So it was done through a, an artery in the leg and they feed a little uh, a wire up into the heart. And what they do is they can put in some mesh in the heart in people who have what's called a hole in the heart. The condition is a patent for Amen Ovali, um, but it's, a, it's a, a small hole in the heart that some people are born with that allows blood to leak from one side of the heart to the other. And um, sometimes these holes are small, they don't cause a big problem. Sometimes they can cause some cardiac and circulation problems. And now we have procedures where we don't have to do open heart surgery anymore, we can treat it. And what this doctor found was when he was doing this procedure on people for their heart, they were saying that their migraine got better. And so he became a believer that, that the cause of migraine was these holes in the heart. And he started doing this procedure to treat migraine and uh, with some success. And the patient said they got better. And many patients said their migraines never came back. So what they did was they did an experiment where they did this procedure to some patients and they didn't do it to other patients. And that 
asked them how their migraine was. And of course, they found that the migraine improved just as well when the procedure was performed compared to when the procedure was not performed. So that again was stopped, it didn't work. Um, now we're getting up to the, the current day and uh, my field, which is orthopedics. Now, one of the most common procedures in shoulder surgery is uh, arthroscopy or keyhole surgery to do what's called a decompression. And this is where we kind of uh, clean out the shoulder and shave off some bone and, and remove a bursa for people who have difficulty uh, lifting their arm because of uh, inflammation and degeneration in the shoulder. So it's normally in people over 40, people often in their 50s, 60s and 70s that have this procedure. It's commonly done, um, but in 2017, 2018, two very high quality placebo surgery studies were done uh, and published. One was published in the British Medical Journal, the other was published in the Lancet. One was out of Finland, one was out of the UK. And what they did is they took patients and they did this procedure um, to half of them. And in the other half of patients, they did an arthroscopy and they put the cameras in, but they didn't do the procedure. Um, so this was the placebo group. And they found that the complaints of shoulder pain and function and movement afterwards were no different between the two groups. Now, this was thought to be the case beforehand, uh, but surgeons were still doing the procedure because there were studies showing that it was no better than uh, physical therapy. Um, and yet surgeons were still doing it. Um, once they did these placebo studies, though, they carry a lot of weight. Uh, these all become quite famous studies. And after that, it was not, um, well, it was, it's not looked on as favorably, but I must admit it's still being performed quite widely. So a lot of people still believe this works because a lot of the surgeons are behaving like the water diviners that have been told that their procedure doesn't work. They don't believe it. We'll go into that later and talk about why surgeons don't believe scientific evidence. Um, Knee pain, this was possibly one of the most uh, sort of newsworthy and, and real bombshell articles. There was two placebo controlled surgical trials published. Um, both of them were published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is the highest ranking um, uh, medical journal in the world. Um, one was published in 2002. The other one was published in 2013. And one was looking at patients with uh, sort of arthritis and the other one was looking at patients with torn menisci or torn cartilage. Um, now, both of these studies showed that the placebo surgery, the pretend surgery where they, they stuck the camera in the knee uh, and didn't do anything, um, uh, was uh, just as good as the procedure where they uh, cleaned out the knee or removed the torn part of the meniscus or, or whatever the procedure was they were testing. Um, and, and these are uh, very famous articles. There's lots of other articles that didn't use placebo that show the same thing, that it's no better than not doing it, than treating it without surgery. And um, it's taken a while, but certainly surgeons did not believe these studies when they were published. But there is evidence now, and we've published on this and people in other countries have published in it. There's pockets around the world now. And in, in my state where I live, uh, um, we have a population of around 8 million um, and we've shown that the rate of knee arthroscopy for this kind of condition has roughly halved uh, since 2011. Um, so that's a fairly big decline. I think it's still got a way to go, uh, but there's reports now from all over the world that this operation is not being done as much as it used to. Um, and now we get to the area where we have not done placebo surgery. So there's other examples I gave you were uh, where placebo procedures have been performed, placebo experiments showing it didn't work. Spine fusion is another area. Now, experiments have been done where patients with back pain have been treated with spine fusion and compared that to treating them without spine fusion. Surprisingly, there have not been very many such experiments but there have been a handful. And if you summarize the results of those experiments, spine fusion is not superior 
to non-operative treatment. Yet this is a common procedure, but this is something where there's a lot of practice variation. So for example, this is an extremely common procedure in the US. I worked in the US for a year and I spent some time working with some spine surgeons and I watched them doing this procedure. I learned how to do it myself. I got training in spine surgery. Um, and it was like a factory over there. They would get patients coming in with back pain. They would fuse their back, send them out. Um, and I thought, wow, this is fantastic. You know, we can cure back pain with this procedure. And when I came back to Australia, I performed this procedure many times. I don't do it anymore because I don't believe it works because that's what the evidence tells me. And I think uh, I've learned to rely on scientific evidence and put that over my own uh, feelings and my own observations because so often our observations are wrong. Um, injections in general uh, are widely done because they're easy to do and I'm going to talk about injections in the spine because that's one of the most common areas where people get injections. Anyone with back pain, a sciatica, uh, you know, any kind of condition in the spine will often be treated with an injection. That injection will often have cortisone or glucocorticoids or you know, a prednisone kind of substance in it, an anti-inflammatory substance, uh, and often have local anesthetic in it as well. Um, and often patients will feel better, but often they feel better because of the local anesthetic and it wears off pretty quick. Um, and in summaries of these studies that have been done, now these studies vary in quality, but when these studies have been done in the spine, these sort of epidural injections, and they've compared it to placebo injections, where they've given them injection with some local anesthetic, but no cortisone or no prednisone, no steroids in it, um, they've found that uh, the injection is no better than placebo. Um, and in fact, in the UK, they withdrew funding for spine injections. We've uh, made a motion here in Australia to stop funding, uh, public funding for spine injections, because uh, they're, they're a waste of time, but they're big business. They're going up and up. Uh, in the US, there are millions of these done every year, um, but they're probably largely ineffective. Now, I'm not going to go through every operation. I just put a list up here, but a lot of these uh, are examples of where there were uh, surgical procedures that were thought to be helpful uh, and were later found not to be helpful. Um, perhaps one of the most um, illustrative examples is tonsillectomy. And there's a very famous example from uh, New York from, I think, the 1930s. Uh, it may have been later than that, actually. It may have been 1950s. I can't remember. But um, what they did was tonsillectomy was at its heyday. Uh, you know, between a third and one half of all kids were getting their tonsils taken out uh, by doctors at the time. And uh, it was thought to uh, help with uh, recurrent infections by removing the tonsils. It was a very common procedure. Now, there was a, a famous uh, case in New York where they had uh, a fairly large orphanage. They had a whole lot of kids. I think it was over a thousand kids. And they really wanted to do the best thing for these poor kids. So what they did is they said, I wonder if these kids need to have their tonsils out. Um, you know, we better get them checked. You know, they weren't, these kids weren't symptomatic or anything. They just wanted to do the right thing by these kids. So they got like over a thousand kids and they got them to see uh, this, uh, you know, ear, nose and throat specialist and said, can you just check our kids and make sure that I need their tonsils out? And, and so the, the doctor went through and he recommended tonsillectomy on over a third of them, you know, somewhere around 40% of them. He said, yeah, I think around a third of 40% of these kids need, need to have their tonsils out. And so they, they went and took their tonsils out. And then they said, look, we're really not sure about this. Uh, and, and we've now got this other sort of two thirds of the kids who didn't have their tonsils out. We're worried that maybe that doctor was wrong and maybe they, they, we'd better get a second opinion. So they went and saw another doctor with all the kids that were left over who hadn't had their tonsils out. And that doctor recommended tonsillectomy in about a third of them, roughly up to 40%, between a third and 40% of them. Um, and so they got their tonsils out. And then they thought, well, hang on a minute, maybe the kids that are still left who haven't had their tonsils out yet, um, maybe, maybe those doctors were wrong. Let's take, take them to a third doctor. That third doctor looked at them and he recommended tonsillectomy in about a third of them. 
So I think you're seeing what's happening here is that um, doctors were doing tonsillectomies on about a third of the kids they saw. Uh, what they were basing, on, basing it on, I have no idea. Um, but that's what they were doing. And it was probably a waste of time in nearly every one of those kids. It's not done routinely these days. Um, and it's the same thing with a lot of these other procedures. Uh, grommets for middle ear infections has been a study showing that it's no more effective than not doing it. Now you see mastectomy there, so I should talk to this. When I did my training in, uh, I did my training in the 1980s and medicine in the latter half of the 20th century in surgery, it was a, there was a game to see who could do the most radical mastectomy. So for a hundred years, surgeons had been doing mastectomy to remove cancer. And what they did was uh, they tried to do a more radical operation. The thinking was, that the more radical the excision was, um, the better it was for the, for the person with breast cancer. And so they, they came up with these radical operations where they would move the entire breast. That was called a total mastectomy. And then they said, well, that's not good enough. We've, we've developed a radical mastectomy where we also remove the muscles off the chest wall. So there's only ribs left. Uh, and then um, uh, they came up with these extended or, or super radical mastectomies where they uh, tore out all the, the contents of the axilla or the armpit, all the lymph nodes, uh, the muscles, uh, the pectoralis muscles uh, of the chest, uh, the breast, you know, they just chopped out everything. These were hugely disfiguring operations. Um, and it wasn't until the 70s or 80s that they started doing experiments where they said, well, what about if we just take out the lump and we maybe give them a bit of radiotherapy? And that was shown to be just as good, uh, if not better, than these super radical uh, mastectomies, which, of course, are no longer done. Um, and I'm not going to go through to the other examples. Uh, I'm going to take you on a, a little uh, on a bit of a sidetrack now. Um, because there's an interesting finding in these placebo trials that I've talked about. And it's the same finding that, that happened with the water diviners that I spoke about at the beginning. In these trials, both groups improve. This is just a, a graph taken from one of those placebo studies. This was one, the one published in 2013, very famous study. And it showed that the knee score, which is a measure of uh, symptoms, you know, or, or lack of symptoms, a high score is better, showed how much patients improved two and six months after surgery. And they improved just as well, whether they had the real procedure or whether they had the uh, placebo procedure. But what's important here is that in all of the studies I've told you about, both groups improved. So people still got better after surgery. So now we have a problem. We've got to explain why they get better because surgeons throughout history have always attributed the improvement they saw to the procedure they did. Where they saw association, they interpreted causation. And this is a problem because if they're just as likely to get better with the placebo surgery, then the surgery is not doing it it's not causing it and this is a humorous example of of what's going wrong um, you can lift these examples from the internet there's sites that are devoted to sort of correlation is not causation and this shows you the correlation between ice cream sales and rates of polio in 1949 and you can see that these are very closely correlated and the first thing that humans do is, um, is try to put them together. They try to put some kind of causal link between these two. And scientists at the time could look at this and they could say, wow, you know, the first thing you would probably think of is maybe the polio virus is, is in the ice cream. Uh, and if that's been disproved, then you could say, well, maybe eating ice cream uh, makes your throat cold and somehow lowers your resistance to the entry of the virus uh, into your bloodstream. Uh, you could think up lots of examples as to why ice cream consumption may cause polio. But of course, it doesn't. And what these two graphs have in common is that they're both measuring a peak in summer. 
And of course, ice cream sales peak in summer and polio cases always peaked in summer as well, but the association was not causal. So this is a problem. Um, There's also clinician bias that we need to overcome. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> now you're getting my, my audio. I'm going to skip over that. Um, but what you're getting is, is clinician bias. And there's been studies which show that um, clinicians overestimate the benefit and underestimate the harms of what they do. And this could be any clinician. This could be any physician, any kind of specialist, any general practitioner, a surgeon, a, a radiotherapist, a cancer specialist. They will overestimate the benefit of what they do and underestimate the harms. And this was summarized in a great uh, 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 paper in uh, 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 JAMA by some researchers from Queensland, uh, where they summarized all the studies that have looked at this and they showed that this was a consistent finding. And they compared the, the doctor's opinions to the actual scientific evidence. Um, and we've done a similar thing in, uh, among surgeons showing that after joint replacement, for example, the surgeons will rate the improvement consistently higher than the patients actually rate their own improvement. Um, but when we see improvement after we do a procedure, how do we explain it? Um, what is it that makes people get better? Um, and this is where a lot of people talk about the placebo effect and that the improvement after a placebo procedure is due to the placebo effect. Um, and that is, is uh, not necessarily the case. Now, placebo is easy to understand. Most of you will know what a placebo is, um, but the placebo effect is difficult to understand because placebos by definition don't have an effect. Um, when I put a camera inside the knee and don't do anything, that has no physical effect. Um, so this placebo effect that people talk about is um, what I rather term non-specific effects. So a placebo trial will reveal these non-specific effects. And I can put that graphically. So this, this column here is the amount of improvement that you see after it. So this is the perceived therapeutic improvement. Now that's going to be made up of two things. That's going to be made up of the specific therapeutic effect of the surgery itself. So this is what the surgery actually did. Um, and then there's going to be a, a, another bit, which is what people call the placebo effect, but is in reality, um, all these non-specific effects put together. And I'm going to break them down a bit. Um, so this is the reality. So this is what we observe. This is the, the uh, amount of improvement um, that we see. Um, and, and, and it totals, you know, 100%. But it's made up of some component of the specific surgical effect, what actually happened to the person um, as a result of the anatomic change of the operation. So removing the torn cartilage, for example. Um, how much did that make them better? Well, let's say it's this much. And then there's these ritual effects, these context effects, uh, which some people call placebo effects. But then these other things, these, these natural history regression to the mean and concomitant treatment, which also make people get better. And I'll cover each of these uh, individually. So let's talk about the context effect. Um, now, everybody that passes from being a person to being a treated patient has to pass through the therapeutic envelope. Now, that therapeutic envelope uh, is the environment which contains a lot of things. Um, there's a lot of factors and particularly this sort of patient therapist interaction. This is very important. Um, uh, uh, the confidence that they have in the person that's treating them, for example, um, all of these things can influence the outcome that they get. So let's look at how these contextual effects can work. And this has been studied quite a lot in placebo pills, certainly a lot more than it's been studied in placebo surgery. Um, so let's, let's look at studies uh, uh, using placebo pills um, there's been studies showing that the color of the pill 
uh, will make a difference depending on if it's if it's blue or if it's red it'll make people feel differently um, the size of the pill so larger pills have a stronger effect than smaller pills uh, the cost of the pills and these are great experiments i mean th this experiment they got people in both groups in the trial to take a certain pill and in one group they had them sort of accidentally on purpose overhear a conversation about what the pill cost. And in one group, the doctors were talking to each other saying, isn't it amazing how cheap this pill is? You know, it really costs only a few cents. It's fantastic how cheap it is. And in the other group, they said, it's a scandal how much this costs. You know, this is one of the most expensive drug, you know, it cost us a fortune to, to get these pills. Um, and so one group of patients thought that their pill was expensive. The other group of patients thought it was cheap. And of course, the patients who thought their pill was expensive improved at a greater rate. Um, the number of pills, so two pills is, has more effect than one. Um, and then you have these sort of active placebos. So this is a pill that has no effect. It's a placebo pill. But if you give people a placebo pill that does something, so in other words, it might uh, make their tongue tingle, uh, but have no effect on their, on their body. Otherwise, uh, they will have a stronger effect because they think the patient thinks that they got the real one. Um, now, if you go from an active placebo to a really more active placebo, you go from a pill to something like an injection, it has an even stronger contextual effect or what some people call placebo effect. Um, so if injections are better than pills, what's better than that? And so I think if you were to build the ideal placebo, you would have something that, that, is, that is painful, something that people can feel that involves a procedure, not just... Uh, uh, taking a pill or an injection, but it involves a more elaborate procedure, um, uh, preferably devices that are being put inside the body. Um, and the whole thing should be delivered by a confident, enthusiastic, authoritative, important and qualified provider. Uh, so someone, you know, like a surgeon, someone wearing a white coat, surgeons are all always very confident and authoritative. Um, and surround the whole thing by symbols of science. And I think if you wanted to build um, the, the procedure that had the best placebo effect, it, it would probably be surgery. And, and that's why uh, that title was chosen uh, for, for my book. So let, these are what I've called uh, contextual effects and what a lot of people call placebo effects. But what else is there? So the first thing is to explain this uh, improvement that is not due to the surgery. Uh, it's where people improve, but they would have improved anyway, or they improve because of contextual effects, they improve because of something else. This is a logical fallacy, and it's a logical fallacy called post hoc ergo propter hoc. Many of you may have heard of this, but this is Latin for it follows, therefore it is because of. And this is a very human thing. This is ingrained in humans. Um, this is a, a heuristic or a shortcut um, that humans have inbuilt in their brains. Um, and, and so, for example, when we were, you know, 100,000 years ago, when we were wandering the, the, the jungle and, and we ate some berries uh, and then we felt sick afterwards, uh, we would attribute that sickness to those berries and then they we would never eat those berries again. Um, so you can see that this is like uh, before we had scientific experimentation, this was probably uh, a good way of sorting out things. Uh, and it's done us very well as human beings, but it's a fallacy. Um, and, and so why do people improve after surgery? Um, we've talked about contextual effects. Um, we've covered that but there's three other things that we need to talk about that explain why people get better. One is natural history. What would have happened to the person anyway? Regression to the mean, which is a statistical phenomenon and concomitant treatment, which is other treatments that the patient may be receiving at the same time. So let's cover these and we'll, we'll go to natural history first. This is just a slide out of a, another placebo trial, uh, this time in another type of shoulder surgery. I hadn't covered this one yet, but just showing how much people improve even when they have sham surgery. Um, and this was, uh, often gets, uh, uh, dawns upon many surgeons 
um, they uh, they realize that um, uh, this happens often late in the game. And there's a famous uh, story that uh, Cochrane, who is the after whom the Cochrane collaboration is named, a very uh, famous uh, uh, physician from the UK, is one of the most uh, uh, one of the first proponents of evidence-based medicine and challenging current thinking. And he was around World War II and after World War II in the 50s and 60s. Um, and he published a famous book where he talked about one of these sort of dawning moments. So he was like a, a young lad uh, when he was captured as a prisoner of war in, in World War II. And as a medic at the time, he was put in charge of the health of 20,000 captured soldiers. Now he had no access to medicine. Um, he had no access to actual doctors and he was captured by the Germans and he said he complained to his German captors at the time and he said there's, there's 20,000 men here, they're very sick, they had, uh, they had typhoid, they had uh, uh, dysentery, they had open wounds which were infected, uh, the, you know, these were very sick, injured people, uh, uh, malnourished um, and there was 20,000 of them, he thought that, that basically half of them were going to die. Uh, without uh, medical intervention. So he asked for doctors. And interestingly, the response he got from his German captors was the German phrase, Ärzte sind überflüssig, which means doctors are superfluous. Um, so I think that whoever said that at the time was a little bit prescient because what happened was after six months, Cochrane noted he, uh, the 20,000 soldiers that he was looking after out of those 20,000, only four of them had died. Uh, he was absolutely amazed. Now, interestingly, three out of the four that died were shot trying to escape. So almost nobody died of the uh, terrible conditions that, that, that they had and these uh, wounds and, and dysentery and things, and they just, got better without any medical treatment. He came back to England and he started thinking about things and challenging current practice. And, and one current practice at the time was after a heart attack, people were kept in bed for a week. It was felt very important that if you had a heart attack, you had to come in hospital and stay there for a week and not move. Otherwise you would stress your heart and you would die. And he said, well, what evidence do we have for that? And they said, well, years of years of training, you know, years of observation. We know that when we do this, a lot of people don't die. Um, now, of course, a lot of people don't die after a heart attack anyway, particularly if they've already survived the heart attack. And so he did a study where he compared people just lying around not doing anything for a week to getting them home and getting them active. And of course, the people who were more active did better. So uh, he really started to put a spanner in the works and challenge medical thinking. Um, so I think that's just a good example to put in there about natural history. What would happen to the people anyway? And in this shoulder study on the right, we know uh, that the, the kind of conditions that these people had um, uh, get better anyway. They don't need surgery. Um, so what happens is we rush in, we operate, we see them get better, and we attribute that improvement to our surgery. Next thing is regression to the mean. This is a little bit harder to explain. Um, but um, I can probably probably draw it if we take a condition that that fluctuates. And so here is the, the severity of, of pain. Um, and over here we have the passage of time. And if we look at people, say you look at an individual person who has um, arthritis in the knee. Now they may have periods where it's 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 really not too bad, you know, for quite a long time. Then they might have a, a terrible exacerbation, and then it might settle a little bit. Then it might come back a bit. Uh, and then it might get better. And then it might be good for a while. Then it might be bad for a while, really bad. But then you know it'll come good again. It'll be steady, and then it'll get better, and so on. It goes up and down. Now, if you take people at these points and do something to them, they will regress to the mean. This is the average pain. So this is what uh, uh, stock pickers do with stock prices. You know, they look at the, the, the moving average. Um, they, they look at the, the mean. Um, 
and they know that it's going to always move back towards that that moving average or that mean. So even when it's down here and people think, oh, my arthritis is cured, it isn't cured. It's going to be bad again afterwards. Um, but if we take people at these points here and we do something to them, so for example, we do an operation on them, what's going to happen to them afterwards? They're going to get better after every time. Now they may get worse again later, but that just means they need another operation and then they can get better again. And I've had this argument with people that knee arthroscopy is ineffective. It's very well known that it's ineffective. And I've had this argument with people and one famous argument I had with an old surgeon who was a big believer in knee arthroscopy. Um, I said to him, we were talking about another condition actually uh, in the shoulder and he was a shoulder surgeon. I was arguing with him about this other condition. And I said, I think it's a bit like knee arthroscopy where it doesn't work. And he got his back up and he said, oh, don't you start on knee arthroscopy. He said, um, knee arthroscopy is a great procedure. I've got an arthritic knee. He said, I've had six arthroscopies and it's worked every time. And, and to me, what's happened is he's had six arthroscopies at these points. So he's felt better afterwards, but then of course it's come back again. He's had another arthroscopy, it's felt better, it's come back again, he's had another arthroscopy and he's still got arthritis in the knee and he's still complaining. So it's really done nothing to him, but he believes that it's worked every time. Concomitant treatment's pretty straightforward. This is uh, where there's something else that's explaining the improvement. Um, now, there's a famous study here. You can look it up if you want. But this is uh, a study which helped get bone morphogenic protein, or BMP, as it's called, um, onto the market. This study was the reason why the FDA in the US approved BMP. And then the company went on to sell it for approximately $4,000 uh, per vial. This stuff is meant to make bones heal. It's meant to produce bone. Now, if you inject this stuff into a rat, it'll produce bone. But that doesn't mean it makes bones heal. I'm actually not a big fan of a lot of lab research. And I know that um, um, you know lab research is important. It can tell us a lot of things. But it doesn't tell us what happens in real life. Now, this study, they said, we're going to try it in real people. And they took people who didn't, uh, who had a, a broken tibia, a broken leg bone, and it hadn't healed. And they said, okay, what we're going to do with them, we're going to give half of them BMP, see what happens to them. So here's all the patients. Half of them are going to get BMP. Half of them are going to get a traditional uh, bone graft, where we take some bone from the pelvis and stick it in the tibia and see if it heals. And what happened was 84% of them healed, 75% of them healed. They said that these are roughly the same and therefore BMP gets the tick and it got put on the market and the company made billions of dollars of it. However, what happened, they didn't realize every one of these patients who had a, a tibia that hadn't healed also had a procedure called uh, tibial nailing where they had the, the bone was reamed out and had a rod put in. Now we know that that procedure on its own, tibial nailing, has around about an 80% success rate. So it means that if they had not had the bone graft, and if they had not had the BMP, they still would have got around 75 to 84% success rate. So to me, this, told, this tells me that these two treatments are equally ineffective not equally effective. So that's what uh, concomitant treatment is. And in many of these surgical procedures get treated with other things afterwards like physical therapy. Now, this is the attitude of doctors. This is the attitude of, of physicians. It's the attitude of surgeons uh, these days. This is a very common thing. I've touched on this, but this is really putting it in words. The physician must deal with a specific individual, the, the patient in front of them. And physicians are not prepared to discard therapies validated by both tradition and their own observations on account of someone else's numbers. In other words, someone else's scientific experiment. And so we see this all the time. Someone does a scientific experiment showing that a procedure doesn't work and the surgeons merely say, 
but I was taught this and I have seen people get better. So therefore, I don't believe you. And this slide was put in here deliberately because this is a quote. This is showing you that nothing is new. This quote is from a journal uh, called the American Journal of Medical Sciences, and this was published in 1836. This was published in response to a scientific article that showed that bloodletting, bleeding people for pneumonia was not effective. They said, that's rubbish. We know it's effective because we've been using leeches to bleed people for pneumonia for 2000 years, and a lot of them got better. Um, and this just shows you, I mean, you can have a procedure that lasts for thousands of years that's completely ineffective, and yet doctors believed it to be effective. And this lasted right up until the 20th century, believe it or not. People were still bleeding people for things. And you can find textbooks from the 1920s uh, that still have um, uh, bleeding a pint of blood uh, to treat people in shock, for example, which is like the opposite of what you should do. So this ain't new. Um, again, showing the resistance to uh, experimental evidence. This is a, a quote from a uh, surgeon who um, uh, uh, was uh, one of the founders and inventors of a surgical procedure in the chest to treat emphysema. And what they did is they, they actually took out some of the lung. Now, I have no idea on what basis this was performed, um, but uh, this, is, this is called lung volume reduction surgery. They just basically reduced the volume of the lung. Um, how this helped people with emphysema, I have no idea. Um, but they did this procedure and it was widely done in the US in particular. And uh, people said, no, we need to do a trial. We need to do this big study called the NET trial, uh, where we need to compare doing the surgery to not doing the surgery, uh, to doing uh, medical treatment instead, uh, usual treatment of emphysema. And so this guy wrote an editorial saying the call for a, a randomized control trial or an RCT is akin to a parachute experiment. You know, we know this works. You don't need to do a randomized control trial of, of parachutes. Uh, it's inappropriate because uh, this operation is so effective. Uh, people basically just get better immediately afterwards. Now, of course, what happened is they did do the study and they published it some years later. Um, and it was a, a very well conducted and famous study. And it showed that surgery was was no more effective than not doing the surgery. But the the vehemence with which the surgeons believed that the procedure worked uh, was amazing. Um, and even after the study came out, they challenged this and they said, you know, we don't believe this study. And they looked at it and they they found a group of patients um, that actually uh, did pretty well with surgery. And they, they looked at the lung function of patients like a year or so afterwards. And they found that in the group that had uh, surgery, the lung function was a little bit better than in the group that hadn't had surgery. Now, it turns out that the reason for this was that the people in the surgical group who had worse lung function died as a result of the procedure. So you were more likely to die early if you had the surgery. And because all the severe cases died, the ones that were left alive had on average better lung function than the other group. So this again was a false finding. And again, this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, you, can, you can look it up. Um, Multiple sclerosis, this is a really interesting example because multiple sclerosis is a devastating condition, but a very varying condition. And there's, there's a certain types of multiple sclerosis called remitting, relapsing. You know, so it can be quite bad for a while, then it can get better, then it can get bad. So it can follow this, this sort of, um, uh, uh, you know, this, this sort of uh, up and down path where, you know, it can be bad for a while, it can be good for a while and then in between. And so um, uh, there was a physician that developed a procedure for multiple sclerosis um, and, and felt that this was, was effective, the surgical procedure. Um, and it was a procedure to tie off the veins in the neck because he, well, to open up the veins in the neck because he felt that venous congestion in the brain was 
was actually causing the procedure. And that was later shown to be wrong. And I'm gonna show you exactly what happened to that uh, in, an, in, uh, in greater detail later, because that was a quite a famous example. And the surgeon that did that um, in the end did the right thing. So I'll, I'll, I'll cover it now. So this was his first um, uh, publication. The guy called Paolo Samboni, he's from, he's from uh, Italy, and he had this procedure. Now people with multiple sclerosis were flying from all over the world to have this procedure done, this uh, procedure to open up the veins um, coming from the brain. And uh, he probably earned a fair bit of money doing this procedure. But to his credit, he, he actually did a randomized control trial where he um, looked at doing this procedure compared to not doing this procedure. And he conceded um, that his own uh, therapy, uh, once a source of hope, was largely ineffective. And to his credit, at the time of the initial study, even though he was doing the procedure, he said the results of this pilot study warrant a subsequent randomized control trial. So this is the way it's supposed to happen. Sure, have some crazy idea that might work, um, and, 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 and that's fantastic. That's how we discover things. You know, I have no problem with this at all as long as you then test it in a scientific manner. And if it doesn't work, then you give up. You know, th this is the way it should happen. Unfortunately, what happens is we come up with an idea and then we stop there and we just do it. And we operate on everybody and we never actually test it properly. And unfortunately, that's the history of surgery. So what surgery historically relies on is these three things. Uh, a plausible mechanism, but you can find a plausible mechanism for just about anything. So I really don't think a biological, biological plausible mechanism is necessary, but it is not sufficient because I can make up a biological plausible mechanism for just about any crackpot operation. Um, there's always some laboratory evidence, but as I said, laboratory evidence does not always translate into the real world. And observational studies. So these are, these are seeing people get better. So these are not controlled trials, not randomized controlled trials. And what should be used to determine the effectiveness of anything is um, the method with the, the least error. And the method with the least error is, is basically uh, science. The science is, is a tool of uh, error reduction. That's all it is. People say, oh, science you know, tells you the truth. It doesn't tell you the truth. It tells you the least wrong estimate of the truth. And you can reduce random error. You can reduce systematic error. So this is, these are just the principles of science. But the, the randomized trials with low risk of bias are the, are the best way of doing it. Now, unfortunately, randomized trials, you know, they're raised as the gold standard and they probably are the gold standard, but they're not always done well. So people think whenever they see a randomized controlled trial, well, that's the answer. And, and often nothing could be further from the truth uh, because they're often done very badly. I give this example here of two knee arthroscopy trials. Now, one of these trials published in 1995 is the worst randomized control trial ever published in the field of knee arthroscopy. It is a terrible randomized control trial. I don't think the patients were blinded. Uh, I'm not sure that it was truly randomized. Um, it, was, it was done very poorly. Uh, and this one published in 2013, uh, was another study showing, um, uh, looking at uh, placebo surgery. And this was perhaps the highest quality surgical trial I've ever seen. Um, not only were the patients blinded, but the people who saw the patients afterwards and measured their outcomes were blinded. The statisticians who did the analysis were not told which group was which. They were just given a sort of an A and a B. They weren't told which one was real and which one was placebo. And even the doctors who did the study wrote the article without knowing which group was which. They had to write two versions of the article, depending on whether A was placebo or B was placebo. And then they signed a contract saying that they would stick to that version of the article after they were unblinded. So this is about the lowest quality study you can get. It's a very famous study uh, for being uh, one of the best studies in surgery. So this study, of course, showed no difference between the two groups at all. And this study which was a terrible uh, study showed that surgery did fantastically. And if you didn't have surgery, you were worse off. 
So how much randomized trial support is there out there for uh, orthopedic surgical procedures? We published this study a few years back in PLOS One, you can look it up. Um, and we looked at three hospitals in Sydney, Australia, three different hospitals, one very large trauma referral hospital, one very large elective hospital, and one kind of mixed hospital that did a bit of everything. And uh, we looked at over 9,000 uh, orthopedic procedures, uh, everything that was done. And we looked at the evidence for it. And we, we said, how many of these procedures have been subjected to a randomized trial, comparing them to not doing the procedure? Um, and we found that it was roughly around about 50% had been subjected to uh, uh, randomized trial. And that's actually not unusual. So in a lot of medicine, you'll find that only 50% of what we do has been subjected to a randomized trial, comparing it to not doing it. However, what we found was that of that 50%, around half, there was at least one trial that showed that it was not effective. So we were doing a lot of procedures. So this is, for example, knee arthroscopy was one of the procedures, shoulder arthroscopy. Uh, there was good evidence that it was not effective and yet we were still doing it. So we have two problems here. We have an evidence gap where half the things we do have not been tested. And we have an evidence practice gap where half the things we do uh, that have been tested don't work, but we're still doing them. Uh, also published more recently, this was uh, um, just published in the last 12 months. Uh, in the journal Pain, where we did a study, a similar kind of study, looking at the evidence for surgery for chronic musculoskeletal pain. So we looked at the most common surgical procedures done for pain. So we took out things we didn't, we didn't look at surgery for fractures, for broken bones, because that's not really done for pain, that's done to restore function. And the pain of a broken bone would get better anyway. We looked at people who were operated on specifically for pain. So this is conditions like arthritis, uh, you know, carpal tunnel, uh, uh, back surgery, uh, you know, a whole lot of things. And we looked at what the evidence was for them. So it's the same kind of thing. How many trials had been done comparing them to not doing it? Because that's actually very uncommon. I'll show you how uncommon it is. So we looked at a whole lot of procedures and you can just look down this left-hand side here, you know, rotator cuff repair, uh, disc replacement, knee arthroscopy, of course, very common, uh, carpal tunnel, shoulder replacement, uh, knee replacement, all these sorts of, these are very common procedures done for pain. And we looked, well, how many procedures have been done? How many, how many randomized control trials are there in that field? Any kind of randomized control trial. How many of them compared doing the surgery versus no surgery? And then how many of those were favorable? And so this is what we found. This is summarizing it all together. We found over 6,000 randomized trials had been published. Interestingly, only 64 or less than 1% of all of the randomized trials that we found actually tested the procedure against not doing the procedure. It was very uncommon. And in only nine out of those 64 was surgery found to be favorable. Um, we looked at how many of them had patient blinding, because I think that's very important that patients are blinded. 12 of them had patient blinding. That was actually pretty good. And in uh, those 12 studies, none of them showed surgery to be superior to not operating. So that's, that's the sort of kind of evidence we have. And you look at other things. So you look at... Um, you know, a lot of pills that are produced, uh, you know, look at the COVID vaccines, uh, look at, look at um, you know, pills for diabetes, you know, all sorts of things. And these pills get tested against not taking the pill. But when we do surgery, we don't test it against not doing the surgery. We just assume the surgery works. It's only later when we do the, the test that we find out that it doesn't. So... This is the big question. Why do we still operate in the presence of uncertainty? If we don't know if it works or not, why are surgeons still operating? Um, is it because they believe it to be effective, regardless of the evidence? Is it due to patient demand? Now, a lot of surgeons say to me, well, I, I don't think the operation is very good, but the patients really want to have it done. 
I, I completely disagree with that. If you explain to the patient, well, you've got a sore knee at the moment, but um, uh, the uh, uh, procedure that, that you're after is not effective and will not help you, and you're more likely to get better even if I pretended to do the procedure, they won't want it. You know, patients aren't idiots. Um, and it's, it's really insulting to treat them like that. So I, I don't think patient demand is a reason. Uh, failure of normal treatment, this is really interesting. A lot of surgeons say, um, uh, when patients come to them, say with a sore knee, I keep using that example because it's a common one. Um, well, they've tried non-operative treatment, non-operative treatment didn't work. So therefore operative treatment makes sense. You know? And these sorts of things are very appealing on a superficial level. This is like thinking fast and slow. It's kind of like, well, yeah, that makes sense. Non-operative treatment didn't work. So that means we've got to try operative treatment. Um, Think about it a little bit longer and it doesn't make sense. If you have a procedure like knee arthroscopy that doesn't work, we know it doesn't work. It's been proven not to work for degenerative knee conditions. If somebody comes to you with a degenerative knee condition and they have not responded to another treatment, it doesn't suddenly make your procedure effective. The procedure still doesn't work. It doesn't matter if another procedure hasn't worked as well. It doesn't magically make your procedure work. So that's not an excuse. Lack of alternatives. And a lot of surgeons said when we brought out this evidence on uh, knee arthroscopy, they said, well, what do, you, what do you expect us to do? Do you expect us to do a knee replacement instead, um, which is a much bigger operation? And we kind of had to point out to them, no, there's another option you're not considering, and that's to not operate at all. So a lot of surgeons, it was just a choice between operations. They didn't actually see that they could treat people without surgery. Um, and some surgeons even say, well, if it's all due to a placebo effect, um, you know, who cares? We'll just do it anyway. Um, that's a problem because it's not really a placebo effect. As I explained, a lot of it's natural history, uh, regression to the mean, a concomitant treatment. People will get better anyway. Um, so there's really not much of a placebo effect in surgery. Um, and the other thing is, that as soon as you start operating on people for a placebo effect, then really you've removed the barrier between sort of scientific medicine and, and non-scientific medicine. And, and you've, you've, you're basically either deceiving yourself or deceiving the patient. So these are some of the reasons why people still operate, but this is the big one. The main reason, is, I don't believe surgeons by and large are out there, you know, trying to rip patients off and trying to do procedures that they know don't work. Surgeons are like water diviners. They believe that what they do works. That is the main reason why they do it. But this is why we need blinded trials. There's really a lack of blinded trials in surgery. Um, there's there's um, <laughs> uncertainty created by this sort of lack of evidence, but leads people to believe in, in effectiveness based on low quality evidence. And, and people don't want to do these high quality trials. There's a lot of resistance to them. Believe me, I do them and I know there's a lot of resistance to them. Uh, a lot of resistance is ethical. A lot of, think, a lot of people think that surgical trials or uh, placebo trials are unethical, but there's, a, there's an, a, a misunderstanding there. There's the ethics of clinical practice where when we're treating people, we shouldn't be giving them placebos. We shouldn't be exposing them to a risk of harm without possible benefit. But when we're doing research, when we're doing science, we need to find the truth and we need to use the, the um, method with the least error. Um, and some risk is acceptable. I mean, hell, we do, we do drugs on, uh, uh, we do trials on, on drugs of, uh, you know, chemotherapy drugs and things that, that have terrible harmful effects um, and, and it's necessary to do them. But these are consenting patients who, who agree to participate and often patients who have a condition. Um, so, you know, we need to balance the risks and benefits of these trials at a societal level, and that's what the ethics committees do. Um, but where a placebo effect is expected, a placebo controlled trial is, is required. So when we're talking about things like pain and function and satisfaction, we need to blind the patients to what treatment they had. Otherwise, they're going to be uh, influenced by these contextual effects. Uh, if you're looking at death or the range of movement of a joint, or you're looking at an x-ray, you probably don't need a placebo study. And um, yeah, as I said, the, the, the risks are overestimated. I mean, the, the risks of uh, placebo surgery have been studied. 
uh, and, and found to be um, uh, placebo surgery is actually safer than real surgery. And when you think about it, that makes sense because you're doing less to the patient. Um, but this, this is the ethical dilemma. Um, people say it's unethical to do a placebo study. Let's take an example. Uh, procedure X is developed based on plausibility and lab tests. And then it, it, it you know, looks like people get better. Um, and, and then the procedure becomes common. Uh, let's, let's use an example now. Throscopy could be an example. Let's look at spine fusion for back pain. All right, I think you got like half a million of them done every year. Um, you know, that's that's a lot of procedures. It's a lot of money, and it's a lot of damage being done to people for probably not much effectiveness. We don't know because it's never been tested against placebo. So let's take that. It's a common procedure. It's widely done. It's based on plausibility and observational evidence. Now let's balance the ethics. The alternatives are A and B. In A, you can take one or two hundred people give them a 50% chance of getting the procedure or a 50% chance of getting placebo and you can do a randomized controlled trial, a proper scientific experiment, and you can find pretty close whether this works or not. If they're no better off after placebo, then it means the procedure doesn't work. So you can do that. And to do that though, you will have to do uh, uh, placebo treatment on 50% of the people. And a lot of people are scared about that. They think that's terrible. You shouldn't be doing that. I would say that if it shows that the effectiveness is not there, that those 50% who had the placebo are the lucky ones, because the 50% who had the real procedure are probably worse off. They've had a bigger procedure. Now, that's one thing you can do. You can do a study. You can do a placebo trial, and it's all done under ethical control, under an ethic oversight of an ethics committee, and it's done properly. Or we can just keep doing what we're doing now, where we're doing half a million spine fusions every year and we don't even know if it works or not. It's costing a fortune. I don't know who we're harming. I don't know how many we're harming. Um, we just don't know because we don't have the evidence. So consider the ethical balance between those two things. And I think there's a real problem with continued practice of surgery without proper scientific studies. Um, that's the, the ethical sort of paradox. This is the review published in the BMJ, which you can look up 2014, of all uh, surgical placebo trials, um, showing that uh, just over half of them showed it was no more effective, and it showed that having a placebo was safer than having the real surgery. Um, this is something we published in the Medical Journal of Australia, these double standards. And what it shows you is that if I develop a new surgical procedure, I can start doing it. I can um, start operating on people. And if I think they're getting better, I can keep doing it. And I can sell that operation. And I can have people come from all over the place to see me and pay me money to do that procedure. And I don't need ethical approval to do that. Now, I will now want to study whether or not it works. I now want to follow up the patients and I want to do a study comparing my new procedure to not doing my new procedure. I can't do that. I am not allowed to do that study to find out if it works or not, unless I get ethical approval. So I don't need ethical approval to operate on people. I operate on people all the time and I don't get the oversight of an ethics committee to do that and I can make up new operations and I don't need the oversight of an ethics committee. If I wanna find out if that new operation works, I'm not allowed to do it. I'm not allowed to do it unless I get ethical oversight. It should be the other way around. People should not be allowed to do new procedures unless they do the test. It should be a demand that you do the test before you do the procedure. And the burden of proof, what happens now is that we don't need proof of effectiveness. We don't need this. We can just do the operation. Some other chump researcher can come along 30 years later and do the, do the study to find out that it's ineffective. So we need proof of ineffectiveness after effectiveness is assumed. This is the wrong way around. And who has to prove it? These days, it's the researcher that comes along later. The proponent of the operation doesn't have to do the research. I showed you a great example of, of the surgeon from Italy who did. That's fantastic. But the burden of proof is on the proponent, but they're not the ones that are doing the research by and large. 
So now, final slide. Many, sur many non-surgical effects may explain improvement seen after surgery. And we've talked about natural history, concomitant treatment, uh, regression to the mean. Um, a lot of these things explain why people get better after surgery. Placebo trials offer the least biased measure of the effectiveness of surgery. They have been done. They're, they're widely published. We're doing, uh, I'm doing a couple right now. Um, they're certainly doable. Um, most surgical procedures have not been subjected to placebo trials or even subjected to studies comparing them to not doing it. Um, it is the responsibility of the proponents to produce this evidence, and yet they don't do it. And I believe surgical procedures should not be introduced without such evidence. Thank you. Wow. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Ian. That was really, really, really phenomenal. phenomenal. We have, have had, had countless, countless lectures, lectures here at the Real Truth About Health Conference over the last eight years. years. All of them amazing. Yours, I just, I'm just going to say, as fascinating, fascinating and unique, enlightening, and your work is as courageous as anything I think we've heard. So thank you for sharing that. And if you've still got some minutes, I know some people would like to ask you some questions as well. Can we do a Q&A? Yeah, for sure. Great, thank you. And so um, with that, our tech team, I don't know if you can stop me from echoing or if it's just on my end, um, but, but I would say this. I wanna make sure everybody knows how we go about our Q&A. And that is that we ask you to uh, raise your hand uh, and then we'll see your hands raised and we'll go ahead and ask you uh, one by one to uh, unmute yourselves and ask uh, Ian Harris a question. And uh, there's sometimes a little bit of confusion around this. So let me make sure we're all on the same page. Number one, we're not able to ask qu answer questions that are in the chat box. So we do need you to raise your hand. What we tell people to do is, is there should be a reactions tab in your Zoom box and you can go ahead, click on that reactions tab, and that brings up the raise hand button. You click on that and we'll see your hand raised. I know there are a few folks where sometimes they don't have a reactions button. So I've heard that sometimes you can go to click on your participants tab instead, and you'll see a raise hand function there. So we're gonna get to as many questions as we can. Uh, and that said, we're gonna go ahead and start with Amanda. Amanda, if you would not mind unmuting yourself now and. We look forward to your question for Ian Harris. Hi, Ian. Um, I have a quick question. Um, I'm, I'm working, I'm listening while I'm working today. And if I have missed this, I apologize. Um, is there any studies showing um, the placebo versus multiple types of weight loss surgery? I know a lot of people who have had it and there it's kind of a mixed bag with, um, several people that I know who have gotten really horrible side effects from it, where they've had to have colostomy bags, almost died. But then I have other people that I've seen that seem to have success with it. But then some of those successful ones are short lived and sometimes gain the weight back at the end, like later down the road. So if I missed it, I apologize, but could I get some of your um, thoughts on that? And if there's any information that you had via that? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that question. I think weight loss surgery is a, is a great question because, um, you know, as you know, it's it's become commonplace in the last sort of decade or two. And I've watched this and a very good friend of mine that I went through medicine with is a, is a weight loss surgeon who, who does this. And I've had friends, you know, like, like a lot of you have who've, uh, you know, had bad results or bounced back or, you know, um, some of them had good results. But it's interesting. He has a, a fairly set protocol that a lot of them have. And it's an interesting protocol. He gets the patients to prove that they can stick to a 500 calorie diet or 400 calorie diet, whatever it is, um, prior to the surgery. So only patients that can stick to that diet and show that they can can uh, lose weight, will get the surgery. And I've kind of said to him, well, if they can stick to that diet, they don't need the surgery. Like he goes, oh, no, they'll bounce back without the surgery. The surgery stops them from bouncing back. Um, 
And so I think there's a, there's a lot of questions about that. And certainly it's invasive surgery, even though it's done keyhole, what, you know, removing or, or tying off uh, part of the digestive system is, is certainly, um, you know, uh, it can have, it can have ill effects. So um, it has not been tested against uh, placebo surgery. I can tell you that. Um, but there have been uh, some studies showing that some of the, the, the newer techniques, um, the, the sleeve gastrectomy, for example, um, uh, is effective at being able to get people to lose weight and keep weight off. Um, and some of the earlier ones, the banding procedures uh, were not very effective, uh, in fact. Um, but yeah, it can get people to lose weight, but, but at what cost? We actually have looked at the evidence around uh, joint replacement because a lot of patients who have joint replacement are uh, overweight or obese. And we try to get them to lose weight beforehand. And it's been shown there's some evidence that the people who have the weight loss surgery beforehand don't do very well uh, after their joint replacement. Uh, and it's because of uh, many of them are malnourished. So it's, um, uh, uh, you know, and the obese patients actually do better uh, some of the time. So um, yeah, it hasn't been subjected to, to placebo studies. There is some evidence that uh, it's effective, but it's a big deal. And it's certainly uh, not preferable to uh, diet alone. I don't think anybody would argue with that. Even the surgeons that are doing it would say that their patients would be better off if they dieted alone rather than have the surgery. Thank you, Ian. Let's move forward now with Ellen. Ellen, go ahead and unmute yourself, please. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, Interesting what you say about um, the knee. I just realized I have a meniscus tear, but the thing is I've had it for almost a year. I didn't realize what it was. And I'm not like, I don't run and I haven't been biking or doing anything really strenuous. And the pain is horrible in certain, you know, certain situations like getting up from sitting and is, are there options for full healing without surgery once something has gone for this long? Yeah, the thing about, I mean, this is something that, which is my area of expertise. We've just submitted a paper for publication looking at this. Um, and the problem is the meniscus tear, if it is a degenerative tear, and I should point out there's two kinds of tears. So you can get a young person playing sport that has a, a very healthy meniscus uh, that tears and locks their knee uh, so, so that they can't straighten their knee out. Um, that's a different story to a degenerative tear. I think anyone over 40 is going to have a degenerative tear and they're the ones where you didn't know you had it. It's an incidental finding on MRI. And there's been lots of studies looking at this. The meniscus tear is not the cause of the pain. That's the problem. The problem is we're using this, uh, uh, this shortcut, this human shortcut, where somebody comes in with pain, uh, we do an MRI scan, we see a torn meniscus, and we say, oh, the torn meniscus is causing the pain. Uh, and it's not. The torn meniscus is just a sign of a degenerative process in the knee. It's just the early stages of, of osteoarthritis. And if you look at the cartilage lining the knee, not the meniscus, but the actual cartilage lining the knee, you can also see that it's degenerating. Uh, sometimes there's small bone spurs forming, uh, which are signs of arthritis in the knee. Um, and taking out the meniscus in somebody with a degenerative knee makes as much sense as cutting out the, the bone spur. Um, I mean, once that was thought to be the cause of the pain and people used to chop it out, but it makes no difference. It's not the cause of the pain. It's a sign of a condition that people have. And that's what happens. And if you do MRI scans of the population, you'll find that uh, the older you get, the more likely you are to have a degenerative meniscus uh, tear in the knee. And if you do, uh, a significant proportion of those people with a degenerative meniscus tear will not have any knee pain a significant proportion of people with knee pain will not have a degenerative meniscus tear. The association isn't there. That's a sign that's easy to see, but it's a sign of a condition in your knee that you have early degeneration of the knee. 
Um, and, and pain after prolonged uh, sitting is like the classic first sign of, uh, of osteoarthritis of the knee. Removing your meniscus will more likely accelerate the osteoarthritis because it acts as a cushion and it will more likely accelerate the degenerative changes. Um, and and I, I'm just noticing the, the con that it's not degenerative. If I don't know what age you are, but if you're over 40, the, the, the tear is degenerative. Um, it's not labeled as degenerative. Um, and and they, we can label things lots of ways on MRI scan reports, um, but that's what happens. Uh, rotator cuff tears are virtually all degenerative because they all occur in people over 35, over 40. Uh, by the time you're 80, nearly everybody has a rotator cuff tear. This is a degenerative condition. This is what happens to the cartilage in our bodies. This is why um, uh, I, I have wrinkles. Um, this, is, this is why um, uh, people get flabby. Your cartilage degenerates as you get older. Your meniscus is made of cartilage. Your rotator cuff uh, insertion is uh, the tendons. It's the cartilage in the tendons. It's the, uh, these are the things that degenerate as we get older. Um, but it's likely not the cause of your pain and you can treat knee pain. In fact, one of the best treatments for knee pain is, is weight loss uh, for people uh, that are obese, but remaining active uh, and exercising uh, is also recommended. Thank you, Ian. Up next, we have Sophia. Sophia, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself, please. Hi, doctor. Thank you so much. Um, I'm over 15. And I underwent a knee synovectomy because of RA. And uh, I usually, and I always put knee braces. And recently my, uh, my physiotherapist told me that I have toughness. Do you have any advice? Yeah, so this is a different condition now. You've got, you've got rheumatoid arthritis or RA, as I understand it. Um, yeah, a, a different condition um, and one that is normally best managed with, um, uh, with, with medication. Um, and this is where there has been a lot of progress in medicine. I'd be the first one to criticize it, um, but I've seen it. I've lived through this uh, when I did my training. Um, most of the patients that had joint replacements, uh, knee replacements, uh, hip replacements, were patients with rheumatoid arthritis. These days, rheumatoid arthritis makes up less than 1% of all the joint replacements that we do because it's not the, uh, it's been controlled so well by the newer drugs, disease modifying anti rheumatology, anti rheumatoid drugs. Um, so there are drugs that can manage RA and can help it. Uh, surgery is not so helpful until the sort of end stage. And I can't really give you individual advice. I have to see your x-rays to see how bad the knee is. Um, but um, sometimes when the knee is very bad uh, with RA, uh, we still end up doing surgery. Uh, um, and sometimes that surgery is even the, the, the final surgery, which is knee replacement surgery. Um, uh, but I can't, I, I can't comment really on your individual uh, case. So I'm sorry about that. Thank you, thank you, Ian. And up next we have Michelle. Michelle, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself, please. Hi, Michelle. Hi, yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, I have a question. Um, I'm, wondering, I'm wondering if you think that it's possible with the examination you've done of this issue that the overuse of surgery is related to the overuse of medical imaging and particularly the inappropriate use of imaging. I'm, I'm from Canada and we see a lot of that here. I'm a hospital-based project manager. Um, yep. And I've heard the um, radiologists and the surgeons comment that when there's overuse of imaging, then there is a compulsion on the part of the physician as well as the patient to do something about findings that they otherwise never would have seen that and weren't necessarily problematic. Absolutely. 100%. Yeah, that's very clear. Uh, we, I write about this in the book and we've actually got a new book coming out later in the year with a, with a professor of medicine in, uh, in Melbourne. And um, uh, that is very clear. It's the over-investigation, over-diagnosis that occurs 
that leads to surgery. There's some uh, great examples of this, but MRI of the spine is a classic. Uh, if you do an MRI of anybody's spine over the age of 30, you will find something. You will definitely find something in, in like 99.9% .9 of cases. And so what surgeons do is people come in, they go, oh, I got back pain. Uh, and they look at the MRI and they go, well, I can see something on your MRI. One of your discs is a bit de dehydrated because discs are made of collagen and cartilage and they dehydrate over time. Same reason I have wrinkles and the same reason we get flabby. Um, and, and so they say, oh, that must be causing your pain. So I'm going to fuse that segment of your spine. Uh, it's definitely a cause. Uh, MRI of the knee, um, and we've shown correlations where, where uh, procedures have increased. And in Australia, we published this in the spine where uh, in around 2000, 2001, MRIs became publicly funded. So you could get an MRI scan and get the government to, to fund the scan. And uh, uh, back surgery, back fusions took off from that point on. Um, so there's a definite correlation. And there's a great study done in the US uh, years ago now where they, in primary care, where they took patients who presented with back pain and they randomized them to two things. In one, they got an X-ray of the back and in the other one, they didn't get an X-ray of the back and that was it. And after that, they said to the doctors, you know, you do whatever you want. Um, and, um, and they found a year later, no difference in the amount of back pain that each group had, but the group that had an X-ray were more likely to have had surgery in the interim. Um, so if you find something, people will want to act on it. Um, patients will want it acted upon. And, and I talk about the incentives here. There's a lot of incentives. Uh, surgeons want to do something because people want them to do something and, and people want something done and their relatives are saying, you really need to go to the doctor and get that seen to. Uh, you need to get your back pain sorted out. Um, uh, the hospitals want it done. Hospitals get paid to do it. The device manufacturers want it done. Everybody wants it done. Everybody wins out of having procedures done. Um, and unfortunately, uh, uh, it often starts with investigations. If you look at back pain now, many of the international uh, guidelines on how to manage back pain, one of the, the first rules on how to manage back pain is don't image it. Don't get an x-ray and don't get a scan because you're just going to find a whole bunch of things that are unrelated to your back pain that are going to end up getting injected or fused. Thank you for that. And uh, up next, we have... Uh, Janine, Janine, if you'd go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, Janine. Hello. Hi, how are you? Um, thank you very much for this um, talk on conservative treatment. I really appreciate that. Um, my question is, um, you, you talked about people with chronic pain and then regression back to the mean. Is, is that my correct understanding? And so yeah. I'm wondering how with conditions like um, chronic bursitis and inflamed tendons and rotator cuff. Do you agree with, um, you know, the guided steroid injections or how would you um, manage a condition like that where, where pain is pretty much constant? And obviously it must be related to osteoarthritis, but how would you encourage patients to manage that? And do you agree with the steroid injections? Yeah, so uh, so good question, but probably a couple of couple of answers to that because you covered a few things. Um, the uh, so if you have an inflammatory condition, um, then having an anti-inflammatory injected uh, can be helpful, uh, but it's a temporary help. Um, it can last, and a lot of the studies that show uh, effectiveness, it's measured in weeks you know, sort of two to eight weeks. So uh, yes, if you have an inflammatory condition, uh, an injection can be a temporary help. It won't reverse the course of the condition. It doesn't, it doesn't change the underlying pathology. Um, and it certainly doesn't, doesn't reverse degenerative conditions. However, some of the things you mentioned are self-limiting. So uh, a lot of the things we have, like uh, rotator cuff uh, inflammation in the shoulder, uh, tennis elbow is a classic. Uh, you know, it's a very painful condition. I've had it myself. I even put myself in a placebo study where they injected me with, with uh, something. I don't know what it was. Um, and uh, I didn't get better. Um, but a lot of these things are self-limiting. So I've, I've had uh, shoulder problems. I've had uh, tennis elbow problems. But we know it's not just me personally. We know from studies, for example, tennis elbow, after 12 months, 98% of people will be resolved regardless of what you do to them. 
So a lot of these things, when you say it's chronic and it never gets better, they do. A lot of these things are self-limiting. Rotate a cuff. We know that most people will improve. I think that in six months, 40% of people will improve if they have rotator cuff pathology and associated pain. So a lot of these things improve over time. Um, now, some things don't and some things gradually progress. So, you know, osteoarthritis of the, of the hip, um, you know, it can fluctuate, sure, and people can regress to the mean, but by and large, it, it does tend to progress over decades and you get to the stage where you're in terrible pain and you can't walk. Well, then, yeah, then you need, you need something done. Uh, I don't think an injection is going to cut it then. I think then you need to have a, 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 a hip replacement. Uh, if you end up with osteoarthritis secondary to a rotator cuff tear in your shoulder, you can end up with terrible pain and stiffness that can be freed up with a shoulder replacement where you can get much more movement back and, and a lot less pain. Um, but uh, yeah, but injections, they're not that helpful. They give you at best temporary relief. And when you inject steroids into things, it can make the, the uh, tendons degenerate more and it can increase your risk of infection. And in fact, there's been lots of studies now to show that if you have a joint replacement, you've had a steroid injection in that joint within the last six months, you're more likely to have an infection in the joint replacement. Ian, thank you. And let's uh, move forward now with Shannon. She's got a question. If you can go ahead and unmute yourself, Shannon. Hi, Shannon, you're able to unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me now? We can, thank you. Hi, Dr. Harris. Um, you mentioned a lot of ineffective surgeries, but you say you're still operating. So I wanted to know what are some effective surgeries that you would say they're currently doing? And um, C-sections seem to be very common nowadays. And when I ask women who I know who are having them, why they're having them it's just kind of the answer is the doctor just says i'm high risk or like there doesn't seem to be any basis so i wanted yeah. to know what's your opinion on those as well and then also just how do we contact you yeah as far as okay. like social media or stuff like that yeah um all right so again uh, a few answers contacting me is pretty easy you can only find me on the internet um and, uh, and i'm on twitter at a couple of things one is at Dr. Doubter, um, one word, uh, and uh, a blog that I used to have, I don't feel it much anymore, called Dr. Skeptic, and also on Twitter at Dr. Ian Harris, so D-R-I-A-N-H-A-R-R-I-S. Um, and uh, you, can, you can find my email. Um, uh, yeah, that's, that's one thing. And I've got an email at UNSW, which is my university, which is basically just Ian Harris at UNSW edu.au. Now, your question is, what is effective and what about C-section? So I do cover cesarean sections a lot in the book, uh, and we're actually covering it again in the, in the new book that's coming out, because they're overdone. They're definitely overdone. In some parts of China and in Brazil, the cesarean section rates are 50%. Uh, in uh, the US and Australia, they're both the same. It's about 30%. There's no way that cesarean section rates should be 30%. There's no way that the, the body is designed in a way that um, it only gives birth properly 70% of the time. You know, they, these are way overdone. Uh, the World Health Organization has tried to put uh, accurate numbers on, on what the C-section rate should be. Uh, they got shouted down when they said around 10 or 15% and they had to raise that. Um, but uh, certainly a lot of the reasons is uh, medical legal. And if you speak to um, the doctors who do this, you know, they say basically this is this is covering uh, covering us because uh, you know we 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 don't want to get sued. I noticed a comment there: induction of labor. I cover that as well. Induction of labor is way overdone. Um, uh, and in fact, uh, if you have an induced labor, you're more likely to have a C-section. Um, so it's just you know one thing, one medical intervention leads to another. Uh, they're definitely they're definitely overdone. Uh, do they have a place uh, for sure? You know, there, there, there's there's got to be examples where you know it's it's life or death, and a C-section can can save the baby um, um, uh, and the mother. You know, uh, so I have no doubt about that. But 30% of the time, I don't think so. Um, and uh, um, 
The other question was what operations are effective. Um, so there's plenty of operations that are effective. Uh, um, I think uh, it's good for me to list them sometimes because it gets away from this message that, that I, you know, I'm saying all surgery doesn't work. I operate my specialties in, in fractures. Um, so for example, very common fractures I treat are hip fractures in the, in, in the elderly. We know that if we don't treat them with surgery, it's very difficult for them to walk afterwards, then often the bone doesn't heal. Um, if we do an operation that replaces the broken part with a metal part, they can walk on it the next day and, and have their mobility restored. You know, it's, and in fact, hip replacement in general for osteoarthritis is considered to be a very effective uh, operation. Um, but outside my own field, there's a lot of effective operations. I mentioned them in the panel I did the other day. So for example, there's been studies showing that kidney transplant uh, is much more cost effective and much better for quality of life for patients compared to ongoing hemodialysis. So if you have failed kidneys, um, being strapped to a dialysis machine for three days a week is no fun. Uh, having a successful renal transplant can basically restore you to normal life almost. Uh, so that's a very good procedure. And one of the most cost-effective procedures in the world is actually cataract surgery, um, where in, in developing countries, you can get cataract lenses, you can buy them for a few dollars. I think they're like $25. Um, and it doesn't take much to put them in. Um, and, uh, and you can restore the sight of somebody who has cataracts. You know, so there's, there's a whole heap of procedures. Uh, some cancer uh, uh, surgeries uh, can be very effective. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's lots out there. So don't, don't, don't get me wrong. Um, but even the effective operations are overdone. You know, uh, I think knee replacement, for example, is probably a little bit overdone. Uh, there's a lot of variation between countries. Uh, the US has the highest rates of almost any operation you can think of. Um, it really is crazy over there. Um, it's, it, the medical system is profit driven over there uh, and it's all about turnover. It's all about maximizing health care, not maximizing health. Uh, the more operations you do, the more money you make. Uh, and you compare it to a system like in Canada or the UK, where doctors don't get paid to do procedures, they could just get a salary. And you look at the rate, I think the rate of uh, spine fusion per 100,000 population is something like nearly 10 times higher in the US than it is in the UK, and where you'd have, you'd think you'd have a similar, similar population. So that doesn't make any sense at all. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of effective operations, but some of them are being overdone. Great, got time for one more? Yeah. Great, well, uh, let's go ahead and take uh, Steve. Steve, if you go ahead and unmute yourself, please. Hi there, um, yeah, so I've got a question. It's kind of like a follow on from what you mentioned earlier um, in relation to examinations, but this time I want to ask you a question in relation to um, how it is that you can make examinations so that not so many surgeries come out of them. Do you mean examinations or tests? Test, yeah, test, yeah. Ah, yeah, okay. Yeah, so there's a couple of things that, that people are looking at in this area. So the first thing that I've already mentioned is not to do so many tests. So, so when somebody, uh, you know, has a bit of back pain or, or a bit of knee pain and, uh, you know, they don't need to have an MRI scan because uh, they'll probably just get better. Um, and uh, so the first thing is to not do the test in the first place. But there's other interesting areas of research. And one is how the tests are reported. Now, if you look at the results of any MRI scan of a spine, you'll often see like a two page report listing, you know, uh, numerous things that are found there. It just sounds terrible. And for an uninformed patient, they're reading all of these, you know, list of things that are wrong with them. Uh, it's going to scare the hell out of them. And, um, uh, it's, it's not helpful. And, and most of those things are sort of normal age-related changes that are not associated with pain or, or, or any problems. They're just pointing them out. Um, and some of them are so microscopic that, you know, we only picked them up on MRI scans. We didn't even know they existed before. Um, but they're all there in the report. So there's some interesting trials being done comparing. And the reason... The reason why they do that is because they want to cover themselves. The rule in radiology practice is to report absolutely everything you see or you even think you see. You just report everything. Then no one can come back to you and say you didn't pick it up. 
um, but they don't realize the problems with that. Um, and so there's some studies where we're looking at um, reporting the usual way or writing an MRI report that says um, no changes beyond the usual age-related changes were found. No, no unexpected abnormality, like a, a, you know, a one-line report, which is really saying the same thing. And it's going to be interesting to see whether that leads to less uh, invasive treatment afterwards. Um, but there's certainly a problem with doing too many investigations, that's for sure. But there's also a problem with the way they are being reported and interpreted by patients and doctors. And with that, uh, we thank you very, 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 very much for all of your time and, and being so gracious. We know we got off to a little bit of a, uh, a late start. So thank you for staying late with us. For those few questions that we couldn't get to, obviously you see uh, Ian Harris's contact info here. Perhaps uh, you guys can reconnect after this conference. Um, again, incredibly fascinating. Uh, and we are very, very grateful for all of your time and, and your expertise. This has been truly amazing. Thank you, Ian Harris. Much appreciated. My in pleasure. Fact, in fact, I, I think there's a lot of people that want to thank you personally. So tech team, if you would go ahead and unleash the... Uh... Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, thank you. 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 Thank you.